Hey, good morning. What's up with everybody in the back of the room, right? All alone up in the front. There are handouts up here, so I will get around and pass those around because it is related to our discussion today. Good morning. I'm Whitney Jenkins. I am the training coordinator for the North Carolina Coastal Reserve and National Estuarine Research Reserve. We are part of the Division of Coastal Management. I've had the pleasure of working with this great group of people for the past couple of years on this project called Changing Submerged Aquatic Vegetation Communities and Impacts on Blue Crabs, Potential Ecosystem and Fishery Management Impacts of Climate Change. Um, this is a great group of folks from UNCW, including Jesse Jarvis, Martin Posey, Troy Alfin, who is online with us today, George Easterly, who is a graduate student, um, Mike Wheeler, who's also a graduate student, but he got a job, good for Mike, and um, Ann Deaton is with us today. She's with the Division of Marine Fisheries, and she's going to talk about the Coastal Habitat Protection Program and how this work um, applies to that program. So um, I think there's only one person online and that's Troy. So if we could just go around the room just really, really fast. And if you could just tell us your name and who you're with and maybe where you're located or who you work for, that would be really great. I'm gonna start right here with you. Sam? Awesome. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Nicholas Fairbairn. I'm with uh, Duke, and my pronouns are they. Great. I'm Tony Rodriguez. I'm at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Mike Keeler from UNC Chapel Hill. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Our session is maybe a little bit different from some of the other sessions you've attended at the conference. We will be doing um, some presentations to start out and let me show you the agenda so you can see what we're doing. We're gonna do a few pr presentations here at the beginning on submerged aquatic vegetation, juvenile blue crabs, how this work aligns with the Coastal Habitat Protection Program. And we're also gonna talk about ecological vulnerability assessments. And then we're gonna do some Q&A. So if you'll just hold your questions until the Q&A time, and then we're going to go into breakout groups and you can choose to be either in a juvenile blue crab breakout group or a submerged aquatic vegetation breakout group. So think about that and what you think your expertise would lend more to, because we're going to be talking about ecological indicators, monitoring opportunities and water quality considerations when managing these resources. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jesse Jarvis. All right, thank you guys for coming for day two. Um, so what my task is for right now is to kind of introduce or remind some of y'all what SAV are. So SAV or Submerged Aquatic Vegetation, as what you see in the screen here, this is a uh, high salinity SAV meadow. So a true seagrass meadow found in um, Middle Marsh, Back Sound. It was a very high tide. So we got photobombed by some fish. 
Um, but it kind of highlights why SAV are important, right? So SAV provide a lot of excellent habitat for commercial and recreational fishery species. They help improve water quality conditions, um, primarily because they're just flowering plants that you find in coastal areas, right? So they help slow down water, they connect the water column to the sediment. And because of that, um, we, we're, well, Yasmin, I'll tell you, they're not great at blue carbon, but um, what, what we do here is we, there's a lot of things they bring to the coast. And so because of that, they are protected uh, in many different areas, including um, through the coastal habitat protection plan. One thing we're very interested in today though, is their role as sort of habitat. So before you can really know more about how they may be as a habitat, we want to know a little bit more about the grasses themselves. So in North Carolina, we're very lucky to be in a transition zone um, between your, our temperate and subtropical seagrass habitats, or as high salinity SAV. So in the figure here, you can see um, the, there's a thing, can you see my, no, all right. Um, the figure in the blue, that's Zostra marina or eelgrass. That's our temperate species. It has a very northern distribution. Everywhere blue is where you, you see it. We are at the trailing edge of that species distribution. So we are at southern limit. Therefore, it is inhibited by temperatures in our area. And then Halidoli radii is our subtropical species. It's in orange on the figure. And we're the northern limit or the leading edge of that species distribution. So they respond very differently to the same uh, temperature stressors. I should point out that this is not a new interaction. So Halidoli and Zostra have been documented in North Carolina for at least the last hundred years. All right, so this is kind of a great um, place to kind of look at this potential um, interactions between our temperate and subtropical species. So one of the things we do know is that because we have these two different types of um, seagrasses, well, there's also rupia, but we don't talk about rupia. Um, but because we have these two main dominant species of seagrasses in our meadows, uh, we have a good understanding of sort of their seasonal abundance and how that changes over time. So abundance here is sort of a measure of maybe percent cover or biomass. Okay. And so you can see in the spring when things are temperatures are cooler, zoster or eelgrass tends to be the highest abundance. It grows really well. It kind of peaks out in May, June. And what limits its growth at that point in time is temperatures, right? So temperatures get a little too hot. Zostra starts to decline, but we're lucky enough in North Carolina to have Halidouli here. And Halidouli likes the warmer temperatures. It likes the tropical temp, the warm waters. And so um, Halidouli starts to really increase its growth and biomass and cover right when Zostra is declining and it kind of maintains that meadow. And then as things kind of cool off, Halidouli dies back a little bit and Zostra starts to grow up. That's sort of the traditional model of how seagrasses interact in North Carolina. But things are changing in North Carolina, right? In particular, when it comes to water temperatures. So these are summer daily mean water temperatures. So every dot is a daily average of the temperatures during that point in time between June and September. So this is just summer temperatures. The dotted line is 25 degrees Celsius. Above that, Zostra starts to get a little stressed. Okay, so it's photosynthesis kind of sort of gets a little ramped down, respiration goes up a little bit, and so it needs more light and carbon to survive. Uh, you get above 28, and that's when we actually have seen documented declines in other systems. So when water temperatures uh, daily means got above 28 in places like Chesapeake Bay, for example, you've seen sudden large scale declines that occurred after extended periods of time above 28. And then above 30, that's considered to be lethal. So at that point, respiration is greater than photosynthesis and the plants die. Um, as you can see, we have daily mean water temperatures in above 28 quite frequently, and we have had that for a long time. Um, what's interesting though, is we're starting to get more of these forays into this lethal zone occurring more frequently. And again, that's not a, oh, water temperatures got to 30 degrees. That's the daily mean water temperature was 30 degrees. Okay, and this is from Middle Marsh and Back Sound um, and areas right where the seagrasses are located. So water temperatures are getting hotter. So that's stressing out our temperate species. On top of that, the summer stressful season is getting longer. So we're defining that as any temperatures between uh, three days in a row, daily mean water temperatures get above 23 degrees C. And then we start counting and we stop counting stressful water temperatures. We have three days in a row that are below 25. And so this has been used to define the stressful season for at uh, Yellowgrass and Chesapeake Bay. So we decided to do that here. And we have really good records because of the NOAA lab, right? So we've got good records in Moorhead. And so we know in 1962, the stressful season for Zostra was about 84 days. By 2019, that had gone up to 156 days. So what's happening is it's getting hotter and it's getting hotter for longer. 
So as a result, we're seeing a change in how this, the grasses are sort of interacting in the presence of seagrasses in our meadows. So what happens now is that when it gets really hot in July and August, zostra starts to decline. And a lot of times, a lot of meadows will actually see zostra completely gone. And so it'll die back completely and it comes back the following year from seeds. And if Halidulli is there, that's great. But if Halidulli isn't there, this is what your meadow looks like. All right, so the meadow goes from all the dark cover on there is June with the zostra dominated meadow. And by September of that same year, there's no grass cover there because the zostra has declined and the only area that's left over is Halidulli. Now this was a zostra dominated meadow. There's plenty of spots where Halidulli is either co-dominant or the dominant species. And so you don't see a change in area there, um, but you do see this in a lot of spots. And so was, when this happens, we have that, leads us to a lot of questions on how does that affect the ecological function of these SAV meadows, especially when it comes to habitat. So how does a shift in seagrass species affect blue crab survival and recruitment? So either if it's gone or even if you have Halidulli that is now dominant, is that going to affect the meadow function? And that's when George comes up. Oh, wait, just kidding. So here's what we did to study that. Sorry, one more slide, George. Um, to look at this, we we uh, were lucky enough to get some sea grant funding to kind of look to see look at that question of how if you shift from halidul or zostra to halidulli or um, zostra to no habitat, how does that affect juvenile blue crabs in particular? So we did a paired um, field and lab experiment process. We went out in May to November and last year and this year to sample both the seagrasses and um, the organisms, particularly the blue crabs that are found in the meadows. And George is gonna tell you a lot more about what he did. Um, and then really the big thing is we, throughout this entire process engaged our stakeholders. Um, so we had a really excellent stakeholder work group with folks from um, NGOs and state agencies um, and experts, even um, a couple of the fishermen in the community to kind of talk to us about what we think were the important things driving um, changes in SAV communities and changes in blue crab communities and things that we should continue to monitor to maybe understand some of these patterns we're seeing over time. So we, for that, we actually used um, a, a tool set that we'll talk about later. But now is actually time for George. Hey, everybody. So um, as Jesse mentioned, uh, my name is George. Um, and along with uh, Dr. Martin Posey and Choi Offen, who is online, um, we were responsible for sampling the uh, blue crab portion of this grant. So today I'm going to be talking about some results from uh, 2021 and some preliminary results from 2022. But first, I want to talk about the um, importance of the blue crab here in North Carolina. So the blue crab is um, uh, recreational and commercially important species. There's three main areas which have a substantial blue crab fishery. Um, we've got the Chesapeake Bay, um, North Carolina, and Louisiana. And these numbers um, beside or below each of these states represent the annual average annual dockside value from the past 10 to 15 years. Within North Carolina, it, it has historically been the most economically important species. These stars indicate other areas which have a substantial, uh, or which also have a blue crab fishery. So we can see that the fishery is present in every state in the Gulf of Mexico and many states along the Atlantic seaboard. However, within um, North Carolina, blue crab uh, landings have been declining, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, in a second. The blue crab is also an ecologically important species. Um, so adult blue crabs help support a variety of different predatory organisms. And smaller juveniles help support a variety of different commercially important species, including black, tr black drum, uh, flounder, and black sea bass. Now, uh, Silliman and Burtness in 2002 proposed blue crabs to be keystone predators within salt marsh environments, where when blue crabs are removed from these ecosystems, we see substantial predation upon um, salt marsh grasses by uh, grazing snails. Whereas when blue crabs are um, introduced or added into these environments, we see that this um, salt marsh um, flourishes. Um, so what is causing a decline in these blue crabs? Um, first is habitat loss and alterations. And um, seagrasses here in North Carolina are among these, uh, the most important nursery habitats for juvenile blue crabs. And they're being altered and degraded um, throughout the state. Uh, dead zones are also killing food that is needed for survival. And then overfishing is thought to be of a background concern um, for the decline in blue crabs. Um, as a result in the decline, um, we have seen economic loss, so a variety of different crab-related jobs uh, throughout the state. 
Um, there's also been a cultural aspect that has been impacted um, within North Carolina. Fishermen, uh, there have been uh, fishermen that have fished the waters um, for their entire lives or generationally, and they're simply not catching the number of crabs that they once were able to, so therefore it's impacting their livelihood. And in addition, um, as I mentioned before, food webs are expected to be altered. But I wanted to uh, revisit this point of habitat loss and alterations. Um, so blue crabs exhibit a very complex life cycle, um, but, let's see. whoops. Um, but if we look at the uh, megalope and the juvenile stages, these are um, very vulnerable stages uh, to the blue crab population and they rely on nursery habitats such as seagrass meadows um, to survive. So therefore, um, these stages are uh, is a bottleneck phase for the um, overall population. Um, and as I mentioned before, seagrasses are the most important habitat supporting um, this, these megalope and juvenile stages. So um, just to reiterate some of what uh, Jesse talked about before, in North Carolina, we've got Zash Marina and Haladuli Ridei. Um, as Jesse said, one's a temperate species. Uh, Zosphorine is a temperate species. Haladuli is a tropical species. Uh, Zostra is thermally stressed in the summer. Haladuli is thermally stressed um, in the winter. But these two species vary in structural complexity and blade morphology, which has been shown to be an important factor influencing habitat selection and survival of juvenile blue crabs. So some studies um, have found that uh, larger juvenile crabs have been more have been found to be more associated with lower shoot density seagrasses such as Zosphorina, whereas smaller crabs have been found to be more associated with higher density grasses such as Halogeli ridei. So therefore the, um, the landscape of these seagrasses within the state are changing. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about some of those results from that. Um, so the overall uh, objectives of this study was to look at the juvenile densities and size distributions of um, juvenile blue crabs among Zosphorina, Halogeli ridei, and unvegetated habitats. And then we also conducted a habitat choice experiment to determine whether predator presence impacts um, habitat selection among different sizes of juveniles. Uh, so, um, to do this, we conducted monthly field sampling from April through November of 2021 and 2022. We had four different sampling locations within Topsail Sound, and we had one uh, sampling site up in uh, the New River. Within each one of these locations, we identified patches dominated by Zostra, Haladuli, and unvegetated substrates. And then we used these uh, traps to actually sample the crabs. But before uh, talking about the densities of the crabs, I first want to display uh, what was happening with um, the abundance or the presence absence of Zostra and Haladuli within each of these locations. So um, we did bin each of these months into seasons where we had two months per season. Anything that pops up in blue indicates that that habitat was present and therefore it was sampled. And anything that pops up in uh, yellow indicates that, that habitat was absent. So unvegetated, of course, was present year round. Uh, Haladuli ridei was also present year round in both locations, but when we look at Zosh Marina, uh, we see it, its presence from April through July, it starts to decline in August and then it's largely absent from September through November. Um, this figure here shows the uh, results from the densities of juvenile blue crabs in each of these habitats in 2021, where we have the density of the juvenile blue crabs per meter squared on the y-axis, and we have our different seasons that each of these months were bent into on the x-axis. The dark blue is Zosphorina, the light blue is Haladuli ridei, and the beige, beiges, beiges, uh, I don't know. <laughs> the beige color is uh, um, unvegetated habitats. Um, so what we found in both of these locations um, is first off, seagrasses always harbored a higher density of juvenile blue crabs, regardless of seagrass species compared to unvegetated areas. We do see differences in the abundance of blue crabs uh, between these two locations. There is a difference in the scale um, on the y-axis where New River on average had a higher densities of blue crabs compared to Topsail Sound. We also see uh, some very or some differences uh, within months as well, such as in New River in the summer, we saw much higher densities of juvenile blue crabs in Haladuli ridei compared to Zosh Marina. And this was a uh, season in which both of these seagrasses were present. Now, looking at the size distributions of the um, juvenile blue crabs 
so on the top figure is New River, the bottom figure is Topsail Sound. Within New River, we saw no difference in sizes between um, of juvenile blue crabs between Zosh Marina and Halidouli Radii. But in Topsail Sound during the months of May and June, we saw um, we found larger crabs uh, more often in Zosh Marina and smaller crabs more often in Halidouli Radii in both of these months. And then, um, as I mentioned before, we also conducted a habitat choice study with two different sizes of blue crabs. We did try to plant live seagrass um, in these tanks, but the seagrass died very quickly, so we switched to artificial seagrass, so that artificial seagrass acted more as a structural mimic. Um, one of these tanks had a predator, and one of the tanks, tanks didn't have a predator. And so the results from the habitat choice study, um, in red is the control treatment, so the uh, tank without the predator, and in beige is the uh, predator treatment for both of these uh, size classes. And what we found was that for both, uh, both size classes, um, when given a choice, juveniles always or usually chose the structure of seagrasses or artificial seagrass compared to unvegetated substrates. And, it, and that did not matter whether there was a predator present, present or not. Um, they preferred the structure of seagrass. So these results are um, similar to our field density uh, findings where they chose or they preferred the structure of um, structure compared to non-structure. And then finally, um, I wanted to present the preliminary results from 2022 for our densities. So the top part of this figure here are the um, density figures that I just showed you from 2021. And the bottom figure is are the preliminary results from the densities of 2022. And what we found um, was that there, um, again, just like 2021, there were uh, juveniles, um, there were higher densities of juveniles in seagrasses, regardless of seagrass species compared to unvegetated substrates. Um, we do see some interannual variability in the differences of blue crabs, and we do see differences in um, the uh, peak abundance or peak densities of blue crabs between these two years. But overall, 2022 did show similar results as, as 2021. So the major implications of this study, um, first off, is the juvenile stage is a critical stage contributing to the blue crab fishery. This is a stage that experiences very high uh, predation rates and therefore is a bottleneck to the population. Um, this study highlighted uh, the importance of seagrasses as structural and nursery habitats for juvenile blue crabs um, for both our densities uh, findings in 2021 and 2022, as well as our habitat choice study um, they all of these results um, suggested that blue crabs prefer the structure of seagrasses compared to unvegetated habitats. Um, this study provided a baseline to understanding habitat preference and utilization among seagrasses coexisting within the same meadow. And then um, it's also important for understanding the role of Halidouli radii. Um, there was no evidence for a lesser use of Halidouli compared to Zosh Marina. Um, and there was even some evidence to suggest that Halidouli was utilized to a greater degree than Zostra, but that does vary seasonally. So as a result, we do need to treat Halidouli radii as an important component of seagrass habitats within North Carolina. And so even with this shift in um, seagrass composition, uh, conservation and restoration of seagrasses needs to be a focal Point in overall fisheries management. We know that these seagrass meadows do harbor very high densities of, of juvenile blue crabs, as well as a variety of other um, uh, commercially and recreationally important species. Um, and therefore, uh, we need these seagrass meadows and so these uh, juveniles can survive to adulthood to contribute uh, not only to the spawning stock, to the, but to the um, overall uh, recreationally and commercially important uh, fishery. And then uh, Anne is going to talk about the uh, Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. Good morning. Um, my name is Anne Deaton. I'm with Division of Marine Fisheries. I work out of the uh, Wilmington office, and I'm in the Habitat and Enhancement section. So today I'm here because I was on the stakeholder advisory committee for this project and um, a collaborative grant, I believe it was. So um, they asked me to just come give perspective on the management aspect and why this research is important to us. 
So to start with, um, the I was gonna explain what a coastal habitat protection plan is for some people that um, may not be familiar with it. So this is a key mechanism we have in North Carolina to protect and manage our coastal fish habitats. Um, the law is also known as the Fishery Reform Act came into place in 1997 because of concerns about water quality and habitat and that um, all of the, um, the commissions recognized that they can't just regulate like fisheries to get the fish populations better. They needed to address habitat and water quality. And so the law requires that the Department of Environmental Quality, which I'm in, and includes several divisions, work together to draft this, this habitat plan. Um, and so that would include not just Division of Marine Fisheries, but includes Division of Coastal Management, Division of Water Resources. We now have a division of energy, mineral, and land resources, which they address stormwater runoff, so they're involved, as well as Albemarle Pamlico National Estuary Program Partnership. So um, the staff come together, they draft these plans, they're supposed to update them every five years. But the unique thing is it requires all the three regulatory commissions um, that address habitat water quality in our state work together so that we have a CHIP steering committee. And that's a subset of commissioners from Marine Fisheries Commission, Environmental Management Commission, and Coastal Management, Coastal Resource Management. Um, so they have to approve the plan. They give input on what they want to address. But the important thing to remember is it didn't really come into place because of habitat per se, but because to protect the fisheries. But they did recognize you need to protect the fisheries by protecting the habitat. So, um, so like I mentioned, the plan gets updated on five-year cycles. So when we were starting to do the 2021 plan, what was finished in 2021, um, we had discussions with our steering committee and despite some progress that we've made in the past from some of the other um, plans and the recommendations in the plan, water quality was still a problem. And it became really clear when, if you're aware of like all the algal blooms that have occurred in Elmer Sound and we have hypoxia and other things. So we said like that is controlling the SAV, it's affecting the oysters. So this plan focused on five key issues, all related to water quality. So the main one was SAV protection and restoration through water quality improvements. And then we had three other, um, issue papers that related to different ways of improving water quality. One, by improving our wetlands and using them as a nature-based solution to runoff. One, to improve um, enforcement of the existing and compliance of existing rules we have. And one, to address wastewater infrastructure. So when sewer lines have leaks and burst, those sanitary sewer overflows are a major source of pollutants into our, our estuary. And then last but not least is we needed more habitat monitoring so we can assess trends. So despite the fact we've been working on this, these plans since, you know, 1997, <laughs> um, we don't have strong habitat monitoring programs of regular, regular going out in detail in our state. So we have that as a need and have some actions in there to address. So how does this, Affect how is this related um, to this research project? Well, this project is particularly important because of two reasons. One, blue crab is our number one fishery in the state. I think George mentioned that. Um, I have last in year 2020, 19 million dollars. So, and the 13 million pounds. So, it's our most important fishery. And it's also important because of its role in the ecosystem as a prey and a predator. So it, if it declines, it's going to affect and get things off balance. And then the second reason is because seagrass is so important to um, our state and our estuary. So we know that it supports not only blue crabs, but over 150 fish and invertebrates. And that it's also very sensitive to water quality degradation. So we have concerns because we know water quality is going down and we also know that it would be sensitive potentially to climate change due to temperature and other stressors, storms. So um, 
let's see. Okay, so I got all that. <laughs> all right, so it's important. This, this project could be very helpful to helping us manage our resources. So this is a map of the historic extent of SAV in North Carolina, which includes from 1981 to 2021. So what we've done here is compiled on top of each other, any, any positive confirmations of seagrass when we've mapped it. So it doesn't mean it was all there at any one time. So, but that is our maximum footprint that we know of, that we've documented, and it's 191,000 acres. So when we were working on the plan, we said, okay, that's, that's gonna be our goal then, is that we should strive to have 191,000 acres of seagrass, right? Seems um, fair. And um, just to put it in context though, of that, we have both low and high salinity grasses. So we have the sea grasses along the Outer Banks and then up in the Albemarle Sound and the, and the Tar and Noose Rivers, we have low salinity species and Curry Tuck Sound, can't forget Curry Tuck. So of the high salinity sea grasses, um, the maximum extent is about 150,000 and the rest would be low salinity grasses. But in the 2020, the last assessment that APNET put together, there's only 95,000 approximately acres of the high salinity grasses right now. So according to some of the scientists that work with APNEP on their stack, that, that's showing a reduction. We're seeing loss and we're seeing an increase in patchiness of the seagrass. So that can be a sign of deterioration and concern and the density change can affect how beneficial it is to fish because they use it as a refuge. So we know that the grass is important. We've known this a long time. Um, and before there was a coastal habitat plan, the Marine Fisheries Commission took actions to protect it, but only through the ways they had control of, which is fishery gear, fishing gear. So this is a map of the same one you just saw with the SAV. So if you don't see any green, that's good. That means there's some kind of protective measure covering it. So the different colors are the different rules that are in place. So behind the outer banks, you see that yellow, that's called a trawl net prohibited area. So no trawl nets are allowed, but it's also a mechanical method prohibited area, which means no oyster dredging. Um, we have primary nursery areas. In primary nursery areas, these are the tributaries, usually small water bodies where a lot of our fish go and invertebrates as a nursery area. No dredging or trawling is allowed in those. Um, and so you kind of get drift. It takes, it takes a lot of different fishing gear rules to, to protect it, but that doesn't address water quality. Um, but when Marine Fisheries Commission put in place the primary nursery areas, they worked together with the CRC and the EMC, and both of those agencies put in place different additional rules. So both agencies, commissions, um, prohibit new dredging of navigational channels through SAB. So if somebody wants a channel, if there's grass there that hadn't been dredged, they would get denied that permit application. And then EMC put in place that, that all primary nursery areas would be high quality, designate high quality waters, which means they have a little more um, stormwater runoff requirements. So um, as we put together the issue paper, um, the plan includes recommended actions for each issue paper. I don't, I don't think I said that. And so because through the chip and the, the, the law, they're required to, um, the commissions are required to implement whatever recommendations are included in the plan. So the one overarching um, recommendation was to commit to protecting and restoring that footprint of 191,000 acres. And then the other recommended actions um, are more detailed on how you would do this. And it's basically some changes in water clarity rules, voluntary actions to try and get people in different and different land uses to um, control runoff better and monitoring and research. So this, um, this research project is helping to fill a niche on that monitoring and research side of it. Um, some of the more specific actions are to establish a water clarity standard for light penetration. So North Carolina doesn't have that. That's a new rule. New rules are not easy to put in place. If you want a new rule, you better have good data to back that up. And the work that APNEP has done and the work that 
um, UNCW has done is really bolstering that evidence that we need to do something and that we can keep monitoring to see if it results in any benefit. Um, another rulemaking action is to establish or actually modify chlorophyll A standards, possibly they're gonna consider whether they need that and to um, implement nutrient standards, which we don't have, but other places with seagrass do have like Chesapeake Bay and Tampa Bay. And then when I mentioned voluntary measures, what we're really talking about is agricultural BMPs. A lot of farmland is a source of runoff of nutrients and sediment. And um, there's a lot of money. If we could get more of these funds to, to support North Carolina, more farms would be able to implement these BMPs and control runoff. There's also BMPs for store, urban stormwater for development that use nature-based methods that we know it keeps the water on site and infiltrates rather than going into our, our surface waters. So strategies to, to increase that usage voluntarily, no new rules. And then um, last, develop and implement a regular monitoring and assessment plan for SAV. So this work feeds into that effort as well because um, uh, members of UNCW are on APNEP's SAV team that's working on um, developing that protocol. And last, um, the CHIP includes research needs as well. And so we put those research needs on our website so um, researchers can see what the needs are in our state from a management perspective. And it's really helpful when those research needs, somebody grabs that and is working on it. And so the work on blue crab use of SAV and the impact of climate change falls into both of these two research needs to determine the relationship between the SAV species, distribution, composition, and effect of climate change, and then to develop key indicator metrics to assess those trends. Um, we have a lot of grass and it's spread from the north to the south. We have a lot of crabs, you know, that I think our our commercial crab fishery is largest in the northern part of our coast, but we have a really healthy um, fishery in the southern part too. So how do you measure these things adequately with our small and limited um, staff and funds? So that's the idea of the key metrics to try and um, focus on the most important things. So I was really happy to see the results of UNCW's um, work that shows it doesn't look like um, a shift to Halajuli will be that impactful for blue crabs. That's good news for the blue crab because if things do continue and the temperature does continue to change, then maybe that loss, we're gonna get a loss of eelgrass more and maybe it won't be um, uh, as impactful. And I just wanted to also mention that the strong relationship between the juvenile crabs and the grass is a great justification for us to protect that seagrass and to put money into invest in that and protect it. And um, last, we need those key indicators that are manageable from, you know, from an agency side. And I would just like to say that, you know, we're really appreciative of, of this research and it's going to be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So we now have Q&A time for all three of our speakers. Um, we do have to talk into the microphone so that our virtual participants can hear those as well. So if you have a question, uh, yep, I will come to you. Thank you. Um, great job, guys. That was really informative. I do have about the rupia and the um, low salinity uh, seagrass species. Have you guys studied that in terms of its role in juvenile blue crab habitat um, in your area? And have you seen any trends with increased rupia? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, so when we actually do our monitoring out in the field for the high salinity, it's hard for us in the, like, if we're not taking a core to tell Rupia and Halodulia apart, right? So we actually, when we do percent cover in the field, um, we do percent RH. So it could be both. We take the cores in and we separate it out and you can look at the rhizomes and you can tell. Um, and so for the, 
when they're out in the field doing like the meadows, it is mostly halidoli, but there is some rupia there. As far as the lower salinity regions, um, we, my group has not necessarily done that yet, but I would expect, um, given that low salinity meadows tend to be more sort of canopy forming versus the seagrass ones are like true meadows, um, it, and you have a much higher diversity in those areas. Um, it could be a pretty good habitat. And I know that rupia is good habitat for other places. Uh, the biggest issue with rupia tends to be its boom and bust cycle, right? It's a little, for as physiologically adaptive as it is to so many things, it's a wimp when it comes to like physical stress. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. second that, that some of our other sampling in the lower salinity areas, you know, down to probably as low as seven, eight parts per thousand, we're getting quite a few of the juvenile crabs. So that is a habitat they're utilizing. Anna and George, you want to join me up here? Yeah, I want you guys to come up here so we can all answer questions. Gloria, are there any online questions? No. Okay. We got one in the back here. Great. Um, I had a question for George in terms of his research. Um, I noticed in, I think, all of your figures when it, you broke it down by like season for which one of the species is being used, spring seemed like the only season in which zostro is being used, if not significantly more, at least slightly more than the halidule. And I was wondering if you had any like hypotheses or data supporting like why that might be that season that seems to consistently be that way. Yeah, uh, spring. So the spring. Um, is the time when uh, Zostra is dominant or is, is dominant within this uh, region. So we definitely see um, the meadows dominated by Zostra during that time. So Halidule, um is quite small. Um, not saying that it's not, you know, an important habitat when it is small, but Zostra is, is definitely more abundant. So I, I would say that's, that's probably the reason why we see, um, you know, higher densities of in Zostra during that season. It's just because of the, um, temporal cycles in the seagrasses yeah martin did you have any is that, is that do you think anything else okay <laughs> any last questions for our panelists yeah so i thought it was really interesting when you compared like the total seagrass coverage to the most recent map seagrass coverage and i'm curious if there's uh been a decrease in area from year to year. Like, of course, there's a decrease when you sum at all versus what was most recently measured, but I'm curious what that kind of timeline looked like. Um, so one of the problems we have is that our monitoring isn't as regular as we want. And so we've actually gotten to where um, the APNEP plan is to rotate so 2007, I'm looking for my app note, 2007 to eight, we did the whole coast. We, we, collective we, but um, blew it. And then they found that like the low salinity grass, you, we could see it, we got lucky, but it's often you can't see it with the planes with that imagery. Then 2012 and 13 was a major effort, which is high salinity grasses. Um, and then that was so hard, like you miss a, you miss a sound, you know, or you miss, so it's hard to get like the whole thing to make the trend assessment. And then, so now we, we did Bogue sound last year, Core sound this year, they're rotating sounds um, to make it more manageable. But that, that you, you saw the assessment, it, it shows like 5%, it showed like a 5% decline per year for five years. Yeah. yeah, there's variability between the sounds. So for example, Bogue and Back Sound had the highest yeah. rate of decline compared to the other areas. So um, overall, the trends about the global average about four to 5% per year. Um, so that's, it's not, 
as bad as you've seen in some other places, it's definitely not the trend we want to see, right? We want it to be stable or increasing. Um, and then I think even like what you mentioned in your talk, even more um, alarming than the total loss was the increase in patchiness. So the grass that we do have is becoming less dense and is less cover. And so um, that makes it more susceptible to, uh, to other like disturbances and perturbations. And it also potentially has an impact on its ecological function. It's kind of a two bold thing there. So, um, and we also started increasing, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well, but a lot of places with high salinity areas tend to focus on the dominant species. So a lot of the monitoring has been really zostra centric, um, but we have two, right? And so they have different times of the year where they're most abundant. So we've also, um, piloted monitoring, not just a, a sound, which is a little more manageable, but also doing it twice a year. So we'll get the May peak for Zostra and then September peak for Halidoli to see how that changes over time. But we've just started doing that. I was just gonna mention, if you're interested in that, the state has an AGOL site and you can get all those layers yourself, not just the mosaic, but you can get the individual mapping events and you can lay those over there and you can see, like I noticed, think, whether it was Pamlico sound or core sound, like there's definitely an inward progression from the deep edge in a lot of those places. So that's where it's just kind of like going in. Anyway, just Google like D-E-Q-A-G-O-L and then you can search for SAV something and it, you'll, get, you'll get all the SAV stuff and you can download it. Well, thanks y'all for your wonderful questions. We're gonna transition now into talking about ecological vulnerability assessments and the indicators involved in that. So Jesse's gonna pick that up. Thanks, Jesse. And this is where we're gonna put you guys to work actually. So I hope you came ready to work, George. When did you take that out? Okay, sorry. Oh, I found the picture. That's where it went. All right, um, so one of the big project, the goals for this project was to like Anne pointed out to help kind of um, identify some things that we could highlight to monitor for both blue crabs and uh, high salinity SAV or seagrasses so that we can get a better understanding of some of the big trends that we're seeing, right? And so um, one of the great ways to, to do that is to take, we can't monitor everything. We can't go out there and sample everything, but there are a lot of people that know a lot of stuff in North Carolina and different angles of what's going on. So we wanted to kind of take advantage of this sort of collective brain power and use that to help us to develop some environmental vulnerability indicators that we could highlight as potential things to focus on when it came to monitoring uh, seagrasses and juvenile blue crabs. So uh, we chose to use the ecological vulnerability assessment sort of framework for that to give us a better understanding um, of where we are currently with the status of the resource, both for SAV and blue crabs. What are some of the multiple drivers we think are impacting these changes we're seeing over time and how are they interacting? And then how um, can we use this information to get a better understanding of the resilience of these two very important components in the coast to any future changes, including um, climate. So we kind of looked at the assessments that can give us more information on that by first focusing on what vulnerability actually is, right? And so this has been defined a lot over the last uh, day and this morning, so that's pretty good. Um, but we wanted to know, we wanted to have indicators that could give us some good information on the likelihood of exposure to a stressor, um, how the seagrasses or um, blue crabs are actually sensitive to that stressor, and then what's the actual potential recovery potential. And so there's no one metric that we know of um, that can actually give us all that information. So how can we highlight what some of the um, the essential ones are? And so this kind of breaks down to what we've seen before with exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So um, you guys didn't sit where we wanted you to sit. That's okay. So there's papers in the front <laughs> that have uh, these definitions on there as well. So we first looked at some of the indicators we could use that what's going to give us some information about the exposures or how likely um, are these SAV and blue crabs to be exposed to different abiotic drivers, how sensitive are they to those, and then how can they recover, right? So that's kind of the framework we're looking at to determine uh, some indicators for these two species. And I'm going to point out, we did not put together a full assessment. Uh, we at this point just wanted it because we don't have enough data. I don't feel like to really give a good assessment for juvenile blue crabs and SAV. We wanted to first figure out what do we need to get more, more, more information on so that we can then put that framework together. Plus there's a lot of stuff out there already that we need to kind of build off of that I want to make sure we're not reinventing the wheel. 
So we wanted our indicators to be um, give us good information on these dynamic nonlinear processes that are driving the changes we're seeing, um, both in the seagrasses and blue crabs. Indicators that would give us a better understanding of trends and variability on the resource and the stressors. And then we wanted to make sure we had um, indicators for both the habitats and the resource, so the, the seagrasses and the juvenile blue crabs. So to do this, we had our excellent stakeholder group, and we spent many a meeting just kind of brainstorming what we thought were potential uh, economic, ec vulnerability indicators for both seagrasses and blue crabs. And so on the handouts, which I hope, can we kind of? Okay, awesome. In the handouts, um, you can see where we kind of broke it down each table um, groups, the potential indicators um, by habitat recruitment. Um, this is for the juvenile blue crabs. Table one talked about the habitat or the recruitment or the environmental indicators. Um, and then we kind of looked at things that affected population growth and characteristics and mortality. So all of these different lines are potential indicators that could be helpful for giving us a better understanding for the exposure of the, of the blue crabs to that particular stressor, how sensitive they are and how they can respond to it. There are lots of things here, right? And this was a edited list, right? So this is one of the things that kind of highlights how complicated these kind of, it, it, it is to pick out indicators. And then the backside, you can see um, for seagrasses, it actually looks simpler. Look at that. Huh. All right. Um, so we had water clarity for seagrasses for table two, um, abiotic environmental drivers, things to measure for SAV condition, factors that would affect reproduction, so the adaptive capacity, and other variables. So you guys will have time to look through these tables and digest them a little bit um, in the next stage. But just to kind of tell you, these were the um, indicators that we came up with as a collective. The next thing we did is we sent out a survey to all of our uh, work group members to see what they thought about how important these different variables were. So everybody was allowed, you know, put variables on the table, and then we all know that they may have some impact, but not as much as um, some may be more important than others. And so one way to kind of see where the experts think uh, what is important or not was to actually have them rank their importance. So um, what we did was we sent out a survey with all these different variables listed, and then they were to rank it from zero to three, with zero being no impact and three being high impact. Now, sometimes there are variables that we think are important, but we don't, we kind of just sort of like anecdotally think they're important or we qualitatively think they're important. We know we see these kind of trends over time, but we don't have the data. So we needed to make sure we could also account for this when it came to ranking these variables. So it's sort of like, we think this is important, but we don't have a lot of data. So we accounted for that with our um, bias metric with a certainty score. And so in addition to having everybody rank the variables based on um, for the importance, we also had them rank, do we have a lot of data on this or do we not? So zero was a no empirical data all the way up to, yeah, yes, we are very certain that this is a variable that's important and we have lots of data to support that. Um, this helped us with a couple of things. It helped us to calculate the scores eventually because we, mul we multiplied the two together, um, but it also helped us to identify where we need more data. Right, so even if something was found to be very, we thought was very important, but uh, we didn't have a lot of certainty, that's a great place for us to tell the state, hey, or other place researchers, we need more information on this. All right, so in addition to, um, so what do we find? You guys are gonna have time in your breakout groups to again, to digest this some more, um, but briefly, I'm gonna tell you how to read these figures. Um, you can see that the x-axis here are the different components. So those are all the different potential indicators that we selected. And they range from PAR, so photosynthetically active radiation or light. This is for SAV, so amount of light available, um, has a very high score, right? So that meant that everybody on the work group agreed that um, light was an important indicator of SAV um, exposure to a stressor or condition. And so reading this, the x-axis is the, the different indicators. The y-axis, the higher the score, that means the more important. And we kind of group them into those three major types of variables. Um, is this a good indicator for adaptive capacity, which is the pink or exposure, green or sensitivity? So you want to make sure we're getting metrics that kind of hit all of those categories. And then the size of the circle tells you the certainty. So the bigger the circle means that we are more certain that that is important um, or not important. So if it is a big circle like it is for PAR, that means that we are very certain it's very important. However, if you look at disease, 
uh, we uh, don't think it's as important and we, we don't really know for sure if it is or isn't. So it's a small circle and a lower end of the scale. And so again, you're, when we get into our groups, we're gonna digest this a little bit more. Um, the same thing, we did the same thing for blue crabs. Um, so you read that the same way with the first one being population density uh, being pretty important. So I think, um, yeah, so that's the handout. So Whitney's gonna take over from here. All right, so y'all have the handout and now we want you to decide if you want to be a blue crab group or an SAV group or the folks that are on um, Troy Alfin is online with you and he will be your breakout group facilitator in Zoom. Um, so for the folks who are here in the room, if you want to be blue crabs, would you raise your hands? All right. And if you want to be SAV, would you raise your hands? All right. I'm thinking we'll do one of each. Does that sound good? So if our blue crab folks will congregate in the back of the room here, you're going to have George and Martin as your facilitators. And if the SAV folks will congregate here in the front of the room, you'll have Jesse and Anne as your facilitators. Yes, I can. In the chat. Um, yes, let me see if I can figure that out. Um, um, let them know we're trying to figure that out. Have it here. Yes. I can share it. Maybe they just didn't want to do a breakout group, which I understand. Are our attendees still with us? Uh, no, Troy, they're not with us anymore. Okay. Do do we know if they if they actually um, 
signed out or if they got cut off? I would guess that they signed off. I um probably six or seven minutes ago. I okay. hit the promote the panelist and two of them took off right away and the other one just kind of <laughs> stuck around for like two minutes and then disappeared. So so I'm taking from this is that you know they didn't realize it was going to be a pop quiz. So yeah. I'm sorry. No worries at all. No worries at all. I'll uh I'll wait patiently. They might join back. I don't know. Um, Yeah. 
They don't buy it feeling very well because I think it's for a labor Questions. I really appreciate your time and thought on that. Um, and our facilitators have collected your report out group forms that will um, stay with the project team. But to wrap up our breakout groups here, we are going to do some word clouds. And so to get into your word cloud, you can either do it on the internet and you can go to at the very top, it says polev.com slash OCMIIS, and you can put your responses in there, or you can do it via text. So you can go to, you can text to the number 22333 and put in OCMIIS, and it'll get you in there to text your response to the word cloud. If you have a signature in your text message, I've seen this happen before, somebody had like their name in their text message, anything that goes in the text will appear in the word cloud. So um, if your name is in there, you might wanna take that out. And don't text cats, because we've, we've heard about past meetings where it got cat. So I'll give you all just another second to get in there. Go to either one, and you go to the one that you corresponds with your breakout group. But if you want to respond to the other one, that's fine too. So our first question is for the juvenile blue crabs. In your opinion, what is the most important ecological vulnerability indicator for juvenile blue crabs? That, yeah, y'all just hang tight. You have to test. The number you're texting to is 22333. The message is going to be OCMIIS. All right, I see some word clouds coming in. Habitat is the biggest so far. Connectivity, refuge, availability. Everybody from the blue crab group able to get in? Any issues? I'll give you just another couple more seconds to get your blue crab answers in. We should have started with SAV since you guys were ready first. Always. All right, I'm moving on to the SAV question. If I can. Okay, here's our next question for your SAV breakout group. In your opinion, what is the most important ecological vulnerability indicator for SAV? Light. That would be funny.
Do you have any more to ask this thing? Okay. Yeah, I'm better mind this again. Who crafts a general edge or a pretty scary thing? Yeah, they go their own way. <laughs> 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 Thank you. All right, y'all, we're going to move on to the next one, which is a blue crab question. I can figure out how to get out of here. Okay, juvenile blue crab group, what is the most important thing to monitor for blue crab population health? All right, just another few seconds. I don't want you to be late for your striped bass lunch. I'm looking forward to that. Right when we're done here. All right, we're gonna move on to our next question for the SAV group. What is the most important thing to monitor for SAV health? Let me make sure it's accurate. All right, just another few seconds here. Get your answers in. <laughs> There's Jesse with another biomass. <laughs> All right, our final two questions are coming in here. Juvenile blue crab, crab group, in your opinion, what is the most important water quality parameter for blue crabs? Just a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to move on to the very last question here, which is SAV group. What's the most important water quality parameter? Nope, it can be anyone that you felt personally was more important, even if your group didn't agree with you. Yeah. 
So looking at the word clouds, was there anything that you thought didn't come up that you talked about in your group or didn't rise to the importance of making it on there? Seeing head shake no. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Jesse who's going to talk about next steps. All right, thank you. So we're gonna take this information and the stuff from our group and we're going to um, actually come up with a list of indicators that we're gonna put in our final report for uh, both Sea Grant and then also hopefully for the Habitat folks um, for the state. Uh, so we're gonna hopefully incorporate all of this as expert opinion. So thank you guys very much for that. I'd also like to say thank you for just hanging out with us the whole time. I know it's a little bit different and you missed a lot of potentially really good talks um, and other places to be here. <laughs> so thank you, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I think anything else I need to say for everybody? Oh, we did collect your name and emails. I'm not just in case we want to get back in touch with you, like share project results. Um, we're not going to be doing anything else with your names and emails. And then um, we can also email out anything relevant to the project because you definitely helped us shape the next step forwards. And we really appreciate your time. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.